And I am going to basically argue four things. One is that we've been stuck in a transportation system that's been basically limited to uh, user-owned and operated cars and asphalt for as a dominant form of transportation for four generations. Nothing like to change, though. But I'm going to argue that we're at the brink of possibly a completely radical change. Second, I'm going to argue that data is going to be an essential part of making this happen for better or for worse. Uh, third, I'm going to argue that this is going to have big impacts on energy, but we have no clue whether it's going to increase energy use or decrease energy use, which is scary and we need to fix it. And finally, I'm going to argue that the, uh, the risks here are so large and so complicated that the, the, the politics of this and getting policy right is, is just crucial. Now, why do I think that uh, things are going to change? There are a lot of things that are, there are a lot of moving parts here, and one of the things you will see is that it's not just the technology that's changing, but it's a lot of social dynamics are changing. So this is a problem that doesn't get solved by technologies alone or by policy or economists, but you really need to combine a lot of different uh, talents to make it work. First of all, demand is changing. You have an uh, aging population, you have a real concern about how you uh, maintain mobility for this aging population. There seem to be some life cycle of uh, uh, lifestyle effects where younger people just don't own cars, but this is a, a, a phenomenon that turns out to be very hard to get your hands on. Uh, you're getting changes in consumer behavior driven by technology where you're instead of driving to four different stores and you sit down and order things online. Then of course you're having the, the stuff delivered by a vehicle that is, it presumably has optimized software that's, uh, by uh, UPS or Amazon to try to minimize the amount of travel per package. Uh, you have with the advent of the possibility of moving toward driverless vehicles the potential for a really radical change, which is uh, uh, to shift from user owned vehicles to buying mobility as a service. And this, uh, to me, I must admit, a year ago it sounded lunatic, but you get but you're finding that Ford Motor Company, GM, and other major companies are now talking about selling mobility. And the answer, the reason for this is obvious, and the, the uh, average vehicle is used less than 3% of the time. Uh, if you have it uh, being dispatched by uh, uh, an, an owner, it can be, have a, a capacity factor three or four times that high, which means, in principle, Ford sells uh, of course, as many cars. So they want to make sure that if anybody is cashing in on this opportunity, it's them. Uh, uh, also, as Russell said, the, one of the really uh, important uh, changes is that everybody has in their pocket this gadget, which is an incredibly powerful computer communication device, accelerometer, uh, camera, and it provides all kinds of resources that suddenly make it things that would seem to be impossible if you had to pay for all of that uh, possible. You're also getting very new business models being built up around these technologies and, and changes that I've been talking about. Uh, you've got a lot of the, the, the nascent vehicle sharing services. You can share a car or you're getting mobility on demand with a driver. Uh, the intriguing thing is that you can imagine if you can try to imagine Uber without a driver, and all of a sudden the economics of mass of this kind of transit change radically. They get 60% of the cost of providing a ride in most of these vehicles is paying the driver. You also have the possibility that with <coughs> these mobile services, uh, you can have an optimized use of charging and maintenance and you know, other things that you, uh, uh, you wouldn't be able to use, uh, do with the user occupied, the uh, you know, owner occupied car. You also can imagine a whole range of different vehicle sizes. Right now, we're kind of stuck in mass transit, for example, with buses that are either crammed or empty, um, or individual cars. And right, so called right sizing vehicles, which is if you're only going to move around with one person in the vehicle, get a one person vehicle, you're going to have six people, get a six person vehicle. You can, you can imagine how much of that. You have the ability now to collect data very, very cheaply from a whole variety of sources, such as the system. Was talking about. And you've got very powerful new tools for taking this data, turning it into information, turning it into, into decisions. So 
there is a lot that you know, <coughs> the trouble is that we have really <laughs> no no idea how this is all going to turn out, but it's very exciting moment. One of the things you want to do is make sure that you're actually making progress. Here is another place where it has become pretty complicated is that there are a lot of different dimensions of progress here. Uh, plainly, you want to have a new transportation uh, system support a vibrant growing economy, which means economic efficiency, getting efficient supply chain. Uh, and it's not at all clear how all the variety I just talked about uh, sort of set out or whether the correct economic signals are being sent to all the players. Because transportation, in a way, like the electric grid, is bizarre in that you have one group owning the infrastructure and the guideways, another group owning the vehicle. If you change that mix, uh, so the, the incentive structure can change in very dramatic ways. I'll talk about that in a bit more detail. Uh, second, you want to make sure that you, you could end up with haves and have nots that are uh, driven by poor design of this transportation system, where you have the F1 people driving around uh, in, in separate vehicles and the uh, low income people driven out of, uh, into very long even from remote areas. Uh, if this has a, uh, there's a lot of uh, there's a big energy impact here. And transportation is 27% of all of the U.S. energy and slightly larger percent of CO2 emissions. Uh, it, and the uh, highway vehicles are roughly 75% of it. So highway vehicles are a very big part of the energy problem. Health, uh, one of the things, uh, clearly they contribute to local environmental problems. It's still true that in the U.S., uh, Something like, uh, if you're under 13 in the U.S., uh, you, the leading cause of death is automobile accident. And worldwide, if you're under 29, the leading cause of death is uh, automobile accidents. So we can worry about malaria and other things, but the, the real killer of young people around the world is highway fatalities. And of course, this, this doesn't include the lots of injuries and disabilities coming out of it. Um, and transportation becomes pretty crucial in, in key moments like disasters, where if you have to evacuate the city, you want to be able to do this efficiently. Uh, one of my favorite stories on this is actually Paris in 1914, where they had to get the troops to the front, uh, and they didn't have any uh, enough mobility in the French army, so they got every taxi in Paris to take the troops to the front. But you can imagine, you know, uh, organizing something like that with the tools we now have. Hopefully not to the front, but in the ways of flood. Now, I said we want to underground the water here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the data is going to drive a lot of this, and the good news is that there's a huge amount of this data around. Uh, the bad news is that not all of it is, most of the best data is actually in private hands. But the fact is that we're getting lots and lots of data from personal vehicles. Uh, you're getting a lot of, uh, lot of the information that you're generating is from your cell phone being picked up by Google and others uh, that are using it for their own purposes. And we benefit because we get these wonderful traffic maps that are uh, uh, that provide real-time traffic data. They're Navistar, OnStar, and other things are picking up data that will give you help during emergencies, but they're also morphing the systems that will tell you or your tr or truck drivers if it's a potential maintenance problem. They'll say, your battery is about to die, or your bearing is about to overheat. Uh, and this becomes a uh, But that it's a very rich source of data because all of that information is stored. Of course, you can get data from public vehicles. Uh, you have this rich array of things now that are going into uh, the highways that uh, Chris was talking about, one of the things that you get uh, a lot of is cam traffic camera data. The trouble is interpreting traffic camera data automatically is very, very hard. Uh, so, I know the city of Ann Arbor has gigabytes of uh, terabytes of video data that they really don't know what to do with. Uh, but obviously, it's a rich potential. So. And you still have these special instruments, vehicles, right? better all kinds of 
of data, including, by the way, things like methane levels. So, what kind of problems do you need to solve with this? Um, well, there are at least three levels. One is at the level of the vehicle itself. And uh, obviously, you need, for the automated vehicles, you need to have the information you need to avoid hazards. Uh, at the present, that requires extremely detailed, accurate maps uh, and an ability to adapt if the weather conditions aren't perfect. This is a really, really hard problem. Uh, and one that uh, I guess is a, still a debate in the community whether this is achievable in 50 years or five years, but there is certainly an enormous amount of investment by many, many very talented players in this. Uh, and one of the one of the things you'd like you need to do is to anticipate what you're what you're basically getting from the, the local uh, driver uh, vehicle uh, data. You see a dog. Is the dog going to turn right suddenly leap in front of you? Is the lady in a wheelchair going to come off the sidewalk? Uh, is the car in front of you going to swerve to avoid something? Uh, one intriguing thing that Chris has also talked about is the idea that you can have network vehicles so that. Europe, uh, a lot of European companies are very keen on this. Every car is loading data into a cloud. It's, it's going to tell you there's a, an accident at half a mile ahead, or uh, there's ice on the road. And uh, you can tell that because the car is swerving. Second thing is uh, traffic, <coughs> traffic management so the city itself can control the flow of vehicles, both in routine conditions and uh, Version of the conditions of unusual, including trying to avoid them. Uh, interestingly, this might also include different ways of charging the, charging people for using the highway. And this is uh, something that's going to be the essential question as you get toward a lot of electric vehicles that can use gas. Uh, and of course, the gas revenue, the revenue from the gasoline tax supports a lot of the idea. And then we have the system for planning. Uh, and uh, you need to figure out if you're going to <laughs> make major changes in the infrastructure of the city. Um, you, you need the data and analysis to figure out where this whole system is going and how the city can uh, structure itself and rebuild the infrastructure. And of course, this really depends a lot on uh, what your vision is of where this is all going. And if you remember my lead in slide, there were, there were two pictures, which maybe I should go back to. Uh, yes, the, the one on the right is from the General Motors Exposition 1939 World's Fair. And it is pretty ghastly. You, they were going to take cities and blast a highway through the middle of the city. Uh, but the one on the left is the Department of Transportation's vision of the future. Uh, the one thing you can see in both pictures, there are no people, there are no bicycles, there are no uh, people in uh, Walker. And it's not, you know, one of the things that scares me about all of this is the temptation is to take technology and just automate the system. Uh, I guess one of the things I'm hoping is that we can have in urban design a way to reimagine how some of these things may work, and especially if you have automated drivers with vehicles that can move around, uh, you might be able to actually mix pedestrians and vehicles in ways that we aren't really thinking about right now. Um, so um, there are a lot of dimensions to this. Uh, the way you design guideways, and what you don't want to do is rebuild an infrastructure that's designed for an obsolete transportation. Uh, one really obvious thing is you have typically 12-foot wide lanes and six foot wide cars. Well, if the driver doesn't know what they're doing, you don't have to have a 12 foot wide car. But that's only one part of it. Um, so I said I was going to talk about the energy, and this has really very dramatic effects on it. Um, and weird things are going on that we just don't understand. And this is a very depressing graph, by the way, for several years. All of us, books have been written, and pieces have been written about people aren't driving. Well, guess what? When gasoline prices go down to a dollar fifty gallon, price elasticity kicks in, 
what exactly is going on here is not clear. Maybe he's still in an urban area. He's not traveling as much. Uh, one thing that's happening is that you have rich people moving into big cities. Moving, uh, and everybody else leaves. <laughs> so you're having places like Boston, where the city itself has a lot of very affluent people. Everybody else is moving somewhere else and driving. I put these two graphs up, not because I explained them, but just to show how little we know about what's going on. And plainly, this matters. This matters for, I don't know how the quality of the life of these people, whether we're actually able to get a job. But for energy, it's not going now, the trouble with trying to figure out the energy impact of what I've just been talking about is there are a bunch of those with different features that we have to worry about. <clears throat> There's some things that save you energy. Platooning, if you can get vehicles that are very close to each other, the drag goes down. Uh, if you can get vehicles that, don't, uh, that aren't sold as muscle cars but are. Uh, uh, Save some energy. Uh, one of the things here is eco driving. Uh, one of the very interesting and important part of the automated vehicle is that uh, it uh, drives so that you're always at the optimum point of the engine. So it's uh, at the peak efficiency of the vehicle at all times, accelerating the right speed. Uh, it's, it's, it's not connected to the engine when you don't need it, which is a big chunk of the time when you're going downhill and diesel. But that's a big deal. Uh, I talked about the vehicle right sizing where you had the right place to the vehicle. Now, unfortunately, uh, there are other things which could move the other way. You could have these vehicles going very, very fast because uh, the safety risks are going to down. The reduction in, in cost, this is the, <laughs> the biggest canoe. If you own the car, you have a temptation. It's not, your, your cost of driving goes down. You're not, you can, you're not driving the car, you can sit in the car, you go to sleep, you can read, uh, you might commute much further, you might take unnecessary trips. Another nightmare scenario is if you, instead of parking your car, you just leave your car in orbit around the block until you can come back and pick it up. There are a lot of horrible things that can happen. Now, the other side of this argument, however, is that if you're buying mobility, somebody else owns it. Now the marginal cost of driving goes up because you're when you when you own the car you pay the fixed cost of the car. When you're buying mobility, you're paying um, for the, the capital cost and the operating cost. So there's another school of thought that says, well, these automated vehicles, if owned by a third party, will drive down. Uh, so the state of California got frustrated and said, damn it, let's. We want to put the right answer in. So the commission did a study, reviewed some of these five different studies, and guess what? They come to a radically different conclusion, um, which is not good. <laughs> uh, but it, it, I think it really heightens the importance of the kind of work that the state is trying to do in other places to try to figure out what the heck is going on. And it also heightens, um, to me, the concern about the drive policy in the wrong direction you can end up making things a lot worse, certainly for the environment. Now, one thing that none of these studies looked at is getting beyond the idea of automating what you're already doing. And so uh, there are some very interesting new ideas that are coming into play, largely not in the US, but outside of the US. Certainly this idea of having, uh, the, having campuses that are free of high-speed vehicles and have uh, automated devices to uh, provide mobility is one thing. With the current technology, though, this is, uh, uh, this is a, the city of Canberra that's the capital of Australia. And they did a big analysis, very much like the one Chris was talking about, about how do they optimize their, their transportation system. They were having the same trouble with everybody did with their bus systems that were either cramped or empty, uh, the long wait times. And then there was the final mile problem. You get off the bus and where so <laughs> they did an analysis that showed that if you put lots of buses on a small number of high speed of high density lines 
and then provided a public Uber-like service of taking the final mile. The business is actually cheaper, but it's, uh, they're actually going to try this out. Now, the economic has changed dramatically. You don't have driver. <coughs> but it's just, to me, one example of like, a little imagination of taking the say, well, you know, look, the rules can change the right in front of the way. And your understanding of the economics of all of this is really poor. So, uh, I said I was going to talk briately about Michigan. Michigan has uh, been doing transportation work for a lot of, uh, for a long time. Love to find ways of, of collaborating with you. I won't go through these to go into detail, but we have this thing called the Mobility Transformation Center, which is actually the little 29 of the Minion City uh, that they're using as a uh, test vehicle. And they've been gathering data uh, from Ann Arbor in particular. Uh, it's uh, something called the uh, uh, Transportation Safety uh, Program. They have something like 4% of all the cars in Ann Arbor are uh, connected to this. 30 gigabytes of data of where everybody, where all these people drive. So you have end-to-end -end data on who drove where and when. Um, and they're using this to, uh, and other things, to look at a lot of the issues that I, I, I've talked about. Uh, but again, I, can't, I won't go through all of these things, but there are, you know, there are huge <laughs> legal issues, there are a lot of political issues, and other things that we can talk a new development is they're going to try to get the Willow Run uh, facility turned into an even larger transportation. Willow Run was built in 1941 to make B-24s. They made one plane an hour. <laughs> Unbelievable. This, and they claim this is for a Rosie derivative work. Uh, so this will be another facility. I just, I, but I want to uh, end on two points. One is there are some real showstoppers, uh, which these two have to be from the center. You're getting all this data, it's pretty scary, but you know. We were talking earlier, Google is already getting, if they can make these traffic maps, they know pretty much where you, live, where you left from and where you arrived, and know why you went there. Uh, but from a point of public policy, for us to use data like that, for us to even use this transportation speed, this point-to-point uh, -point data. We, we don't want to hand anybody data that can show who drove where at 3 o'clock in the morning, which is what we've got in the state of the country. You know, how do you uh, achieve differential privacy? Voice? How do you protect yourself against private parking? They're now gathering yeah, huge amounts of data. And then, of course, there's the question of security the data that you've got and uh, to avoid people hacking into the system and doing malicious things. So, at the end of this, uh, I did want to emphasize that uh, there's a lot of uncertainty about what is going to go. I mean, done right, you can make things safer, you can make things vastly more efficient. Uh, but done wrong, you can create a nightmare. And I think that there's a lot of nightmares in US transportation. <laughs> but <clears throat> one of the things that does, uh, that all of it raises, uh, is you do have this revenue problem. If you're going to be shifting to uh, to electric vehicles, you're not going to be able to charge by the gallon. The interesting thing is you now know exactly how long each person has, tra has traveled. And the one uh, interesting thought here is that you start saying, well, wait a minute, maybe you should be doing pricing for these vehicles the way the electric utilities charge, that you have congestion pricing, you have location pricing. Uh, this is all very scary, but on the other hand, it gets to be, you know, some invention like this has got to, got to be found. Uh, you know, the, of course, right now, uh, gasoline taxes only pay for about half of the uh, cost in the tank. It's going to get worse. You double fuel economy, you have know, infrastructure, you have half the fuel tank. So, uh, you know, some kind of invention here. Um, uh, got to be, uh, it's just on the pure revenue side of this needs to be thought. So that, this is a place where at least I hope I have convinced you that there's this is a rich area for research on many different fronts. I think I've been interested.